Jam. I'm Sarah Cushman from Seven Days Newspaper, one of the co-founders and organizers of the Jam, along with the Vermont Technology Alliance. Thanks for joining us for the Building Digital, Digital Inclusion with the Vermont Digital Economy Project. We're really excited to hear from all of you today. Before we get started, I just want to take a minute to thank all our awesome Tech Jam sponsors that made this event possible. Dealer.com, MyWebGrocer, C2, Biotech Instruments, Champlain College, Fairpoint Communication, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, Logic Supply, Merchants Bank, the Vermont Technology Council, the State of Vermont, and the City of Burlington. We really couldn't have done it without them, so if you have a chance to go up to their booths and say hi and say thanks for this awesome event, please do so. Without further ado, here is the Vermont Digital Economy Project. So my name is Caitlin Lovegrove, and I'm the Network and Outreach Coordinator for the Vermont Digital Economy Project, which is an 18-month um, grant given to the Vermont Council on Rural Development um, with the prerogative of using digital tools to increase economic, uh, <laughs> economic development and also disaster resilience. So we're focusing on some of the towns that were hit the hardest by Irene, and what we noticed was after the floods um, both the 2011 floods and the Irene flooding, that the towns that had the best connection to online tools, the small businesses that had a website or a Facebook where they could communicate with their customers, or um, the towns themselves where the townspeople could talk to each other, they set up Facebook pages, nonprofits in town that could fundraise online, uh, bounce back the fastest. And so what we're doing is we're putting all of these things in place so that in the case of another disaster, that economic resilience and development will be there. Um, so we're doing a number of different projects for that, including um, one-on-ones and um, workshops with small businesses and nonprofits across the state. We're putting in Wi-Fi zones in downtown areas in um, small towns across the state. Uh, we're working directly with libraries, putting in what we call internet interns, who help um, people who may not be as digitally literate um, to learn more about some of the basics. Uh, so we're doing a number of different projects to really help make Vermont come up from the, you know, the very low end. So here at Tech Jam, we're talking about the really high end of awesome technology that Vermont has, but we don't want to forget about all of the people who maybe just need those, some of those more basic steps, learning about social media, learning about online tools, uh, which is why uh, I've asked all of these wonderful people to be with us here today um, to talk a little bit about um, what it's like to maybe not be as digitally literate as most of us here at Tech Jam are. Um, and just a couple stats before we get started. The Pew Center for Research uh, comes out with lots of really interesting studies about uh, the Pew Internet Center, about uh, digital usage and internet usage. And right now, uh, in the US, 15% of people, um, adults in the United States, don't use the internet at all. So that's almost a fifth of the population. And if you look at the population of Vermont, it's about 20% of Vermont who don't have, actually 30% in the entire country don't have broadband in their homes right now. So that's, again, a, a, more than a fifth of the country that doesn't have access to what we consider almost something that you know, we take for granted. So when we're talking about people who, everything okay? Who may or may not be, um, digitally literate, we have to remember that there's a lot of steps in the way and we can't take what we know for granted. Um, and I just want to take a quick poll in the audience here. Um, how many people have worked with someone who has asked you about computers? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and have you ever gotten frustrated trying to help that person? That's right. And, and have they ever gotten frustrated trying to, trying to get help from you? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're here to talk about today, and I'm just going to uh, let these panelists introduce themselves. They all work with people um, and are very, very good at working with those people from the very bottom level um, to help them get that, that literacy that we all get frustrated trying to teach. So. Are you? Okay. Hi, I'm Jenny Martin, and I'm an adult basic education teacher with Central Vermont Adult Basic Education in Randolph, which is down there in Orange County very rural part of the state, and I teach, as I say, basic education, and now, these days, digital literacy is considered a basic skill. People need to know how to use computers to work, but even not to work, because they need to be able to um, claim their benefits, their unemployment benefits online. I get many people come in very frustrated because 
The Department of Labor has sent them off to fill out paperwork and claim their unemployment, and they don't even know where to start. So that's, that's where I start with all this. Hi, I'm Cheryl McMahon. Um, I'm actually a librarian at the Cobley Library in Lindenville. And for about 18 years now, we have taught a basic introductory workshop to hundreds of people, um, starting with uh, GovNet and dial-up in one machine. We now have a computer lab. We have 14 machines, and they're, they're full, busy all the time. And it's basically libraries fill a niche in um, leveling the playing field. We started out, a lot of people don't have computers at home. They don't have access at home. We're in the Northeast Kingdom, where the, the coverage and um, the use is very spotty. I mean, broadband isn't widely available, and it's a real economic um, unbalance in the area. So we're really, we serve as kind of an equalizer. And I see uh, uh, all the family hands going up. We get the people whose well-meaning children or grandchildren give them their old equipment, and then they come in and they want us to try and help them use it um, and that type of thing. And very often we find that families some families can teach other family members to use a computer, and other times um, the patience isn't there, you know, so we kind, of, we kind of fill a gap that way. But very much so as far as like after a disaster or Irene, FEMA used us as a base um, and to, to work out of there. The applications that we're seeing, the Vermont Health Connect, people are coming in and needing to um, sign on to that. So we deal with a lot of there's frustration, you know, people, people are wanting to learn and they're, they're coming in and they're, they're having to do it, file their unemployment benefits and things like that. So we work with people who are trying to build the skills as they're being told, this is the way you have to do this. So. Hi, I'm Mary Kay Dreyer. I work at the Community College of Vermont in Montpelier. Um, I live in Randolph, Vermont as well. Um, I, about two and a half years ago, worked with some colleagues to develop a curriculum on um, for, for sort of basic computer skills teaching, um, sort of aimed at digital literacy. Um, that entire curriculum is available currently on the eVermont website, um, but we have been using it to work with librarians, um, folks from the Department of Labor, just fr from whatever agency to sort of help folks who are working on the front line with people who need help with basic computer usage. It's, so it's, we, we sort of hold this train the trainer workshop using this curriculum. Um, and I was telling Caitlin and just a few minutes ago, last night we had an email from a woman in Ireland and um, she was reporting a broken link in the curriculum. And she's a librarian in a rural community in Ireland and she said, thank you so much for making these, these, these materials available to us. So I, I just thought it was so interesting that this is really, mm -hmm. this is a global transitional space that we're all in around moving from digitally, digitally illiterate to literacy. And that's sort of what this curriculum is aimed at. How you doing? My name is Dominic Lorenzi and I am an internet intern up in the Northeast Kingdom. I work at three libraries and have done so since May or June. I work at Derby Line, Derby, and Newport. And I get all different types of people coming in to look for jobs, collecting benefits, needing help with homework. You know, younger students are even having trouble with the computers. They just feel that they didn't need to learn them. You know, and they're seeing that in school they have to learn them. They have no choice. Now everything is going online people elderly wanting to communicate with their family members who they don't see often. It's, everything is online now and people are coming to me for help and I absolutely love it, being able to watch them progress from nothing to now being able to install programs and just have conversations. I get Skyped with by some of my students, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> why digital literacy is so important. And obviously, being at Tech Jam, we all know the importance of digital literacy, but on a very sort of, from where you all sit, um, 
why, what do you tell these people when they come to you? Why do they need to know the internet? Why do they need to know a computer? I find that that's the very first question they ask me. <laughs> why do I need to know this stuff? I don't want to know this stuff. I don't want to know about computers and, you know, so I listen to that for a while and usually, well, very often they're there because they're mandated to be there for some reason, for their job or, or to get a job. Um, I actually try to show them kind of really neat things to do on the computer. The first thing I do is very rarely show them how to do, you know, get their benefits or apply for a job. I say, let's find something cool that we can do. So I show them all the neat things that you can do with a computer, well, a lot of the neat things that you can do. And that, what, just to get them interested, you know, to pull people in that way. I'm lucky, I know from the um, iConnect workshop that some of us went to, re, um, what was it, about six months ago. Um, you know, if you can get people interested in it in some way, they're adults, you know, it's not a question of saying, well, this is what you have to do, get your notebook out and take notes. And it's like anything, if you start where, where somebody is, um, it's, a, it's a better way to go than kind of enforcing stuff. That's... that's the way we structure our classes, it's people work on what, the, what interests them the most and finding that nugget that excites people. I had a woman come in yesterday who was trying to get um, supplementary medical forms filled out for her brother who's in a nursing home with Alzheimer's and she's his power of attorney and it's just this whole nightmare and then she gets to the website and it just is a wall. She can't get past it. She can't get through it. She lives in a valley. She's got no, it's going to cost her $400 for satellite connection. So she comes in totally frustrated. I hate this. I don't want to use it. I want to move. I don't want to sit. She stands up to use her computer. Um, and so you're thinking, okay, well, how do we in the information business try and connect her with this information? So there's work throughs that you do. But in the meantime, we got talking about, um, she has a grandson who is taking on a project of driving from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, Ooh. and he's going to blog while he's doing this. Mm -hmm. So she's like, well, I kind of would like to follow his thing. And did you know he already broke down on the Alcan Highway? So I got to find out how that comes out. So it is a matter of, of finding that little nugget that, that excites them. And people come in and they, without fail, say, I'm computer illiterate. They could have not even graduated from high school. They'll say, I'm computer illiterate, I'm computer illiterate, and then you get the, I'm just computer stupid. And I tell them, especially my retired folks, older folks, the ones who feel like their kids are just saying, oh, you're just ridiculous, you don't do this. It's, they're actually ahead of the curve because they're in there trying to learn something about it. They went into the big stone scary edifice of the library and they may not have had good experiences with in, um, you know, in schools or whatnot, but they're trying it. They came in, I said, you're here. You're, you're way ahead of the curve. And so sometimes it's just that to, to get them over that fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the work that we've done and it might, please look at it, um, is sort of aimed at training the trainer. And so recognizing the different layers of this issue um, for folks that, and I think one thing we've discovered as we've continued to work with this material is how rapidly changing it is so that even for folks like us on the front lines in the libraries, library interns, et cetera, mm -hmm. even at the Community College of Vermont, we're always having to sort of look ahead. Frequently in my experience at CCV, I find that students are just amazingly advanced in some of these pieces. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's generational, but it's also around access, um, access to the, the tools themselves and also just geographical <laughs> access to, to speed. So it's really important work. And I always think about my grandmother who, you know, had that phone sitting in one space, this heavy black phone in the <laughs> dial. <laughs> you know? The rotary phone. <laughs> I know. So, um, and I don't know if we're going to discuss this at all. I think we might briefly, but just recognizing, too, how there's, there's this fine line of walking when you're working with folks with computer skills around 
not patronizing, but also recognizing that fear can get in the way. And so these are some of the pieces that we hold up aside from just the literacy pieces. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, and not only fear, yeah, I mean, they're, they're afraid, they don't, they want to learn, but they're afraid to learn. They think they're going to break it all the time. It's right. going to blow up. All the time they think it's they are going to up. break it. I keep telling them you're not going to break it. I had one guy come in and take the mouse, had no idea, and just put it over his head. Like, he had no idea what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, great. We have our work cut out for us. It's all right. Yeah. Just be patient with them. But I'd like to start off with something that they, they enjoy. So I'll start off by asking, what do you like? If a lady likes to cook, we look up recipes. Mm -hmm. We look up different, way, different variations for those recipes. If a guy likes sports or hunting, I show him different websites and how to navigate it. You know, I just, people come in and wanting to know how to do things, you know, how to do anything, do an internet search. What's a Google? What's the difference between different browsers? You know, what is a browser? You know, and just trying to take them from these, they know absolutely nothing to, you have to remember you're so advanced, so you have to teach them at a very slow pace. So starting someplace that they feel comfortable is the best way. You know, and don't be afraid to, you know, you can jump ahead a little bit, but don't be afraid to, you know, step back and slow everything down for them. You know, I know when I was first learning computers, I needed to learn. I, I needed everything slowed down. I still need stuff slowed down for me. And I'm still learning. We're all, we're all learning. You can't assume anything. You can... You know, I've, I've seen people sitting there and, you know, they get the deer in the headlights look and they've typed their name and they're just sitting there and they'll very quiet. They won't say anything. They won't raise their hand and I'll mm -hmm. say, you had a question. They've got that, you've got a question look on their face. And how do I get to the next line? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. as simple as the enter key. You cannot assume yeah. anything. And what you're working with, I'm sure, also is iPhones, iPads, Kindles, All of Nooks. Them all these things and people come in and they're like, oh, I got this for Christmas, how do I run it? Yep. You know, I um, had that all the time. Too. What, a what, brand can new I, Kindle. what can I do on this? So it's coming at us as we have to learn on our feet all the time as well yeah. because there are so many devices mm -hmm. that people are accessing the information on as well. Yeah, and another thing with uh, doing just an internet search, people are like, well, I wanna know this. Well, type exactly that into Google and it will tell you. It will give you exactly that. It's not going to give you anything else. It's going to give you exactly what you ask it for. You know, it's gonna, a computer's going to do only what you tell it to do and nothing more. I have a group of ladies in Randolph that I call my golden girls. They're all over 80. And one of them actually had just passed away, but she was 91 years old. They came together and said, we'd like to know how to use a computer. So I got them set up. They've all got Facebook accounts. They've all got email accounts. They don't know the difference between Facebook and email quite often, and they say, I want my face mail now. <laughs> <laughs> but they can do it. They've learned to do it. They get pictures of their grandkids, their great-grandkids. They've learned to upload photographs. They come in now, they're so blasé, they sit down. And I say, what are you gonna do today? Oh, I think I wanna look up some knitting patterns. I wanna knit a sweater. And on that, you know, it's really quite amazing. And I've loved working with these women because it started off that I was having to teach people job-related skills, like how to use spreadsheets. And these, these women aren't looking for work. You know, they just wanna have fun. So it's really a blast when they come in and go, oh, let's check my Facebook. Let's see what's going on. So they wanna be connected. Yeah, they do. Because there is such a digital divide and, and a haves and a have not, but just to, to be connected with that. And if they're going, you gas your car, you, you go to the grocery store, scanners, yeah. this computers, they're, they're like, I don't want anything to do with computers. I'm like, you're, you're using it all the time. Yes. It's surround, you go to the You're bank, you go to an ATM machine, you are using computers all the time, so yep. you might as well find out the fun and interesting things sure. to do with it. Rather and than then they just don't feel as disconnected. But literally, I've had people who are so relieved that the computer did not actually blow up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Literally did not blow up. I, I, I kid you not, that, that is the level of fear yeah. that you deal with sometimes. Oh, absolutely. I've had, I have an ESL class as well of teaching English as a second language, and I got those students into 
you know, checking out the town they come from, unpronounceable place in Mexico, one of those places with, that starts with an X, you know, and you couldn't <laughs> ever manage to pronounce it. But they look it up and they go, oh, well, one student of mine, she was looking at the town and she said, oh my God, that's my grandmother's house. <laughs> How did it get on the computer? <laughs> so, well, <laughs> Google. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's, again, it's connecting people with something they know or something mm -hmm. they enjoy. And then suddenly it doesn't seem such a big scary thing anymore, you know. Suddenly it's not that monster that sits on the desk and looks at you. I think we've touched a little bit on some of the bigger stumbling blocks, but is there anything else you'd like to add to what, what stops people from wanting to learn or being able to learn, or what is that stumbling block that they face? Well, I think... When, when people come to you in the library, it's a little different from when they come to me, I think, um, because I know that a lot of people go to Randolph Library for one-off things. If they come to me, they're more likely to be going to do a course. You know, they want to, they have to learn a computer, to use a computer for their job or something. Um, a stumbling block. I think people think it's not for them. They're not smart enough. They're not wealthy enough, they couldn't afford to buy a computer, and then when you point out they're available at the library, you know, you can find public access computers. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of that thinking, you know, it's like skiing or sailing. People think, oh, that's for people better off than me. I, I, that's not Oh, well, they're used to thing. paying for yeah. instruction, or they have had, you know, bad experiences with institutional type yeah. facilities, mm -hmm. such as school. School might have been a horrible experience yeah. for some, you know, and the, on the other side, I have people who are highly educated, say, um, I've had older folks that are like engineers. Engineers mm -hmm. are the worst because if they don't know every single thing there is yeah. to know about it before they sit down and put one finger on a key, then it's not happening for them. And you right. can't know everything about it. It would be like knowing a river. It's going to change a little bit every day. The terrain changes a little bit every day. The rocks are in different places. So you just, it's a leap of faith to do it. Um, and I think that stops people sometimes. Or, or they just, somewhere along the line, somebody told them they couldn't learn. And that is something that we have to overcome a lot. And another issue that I've seen and I anticipate, we were discussing this earlier, when the stakes are high, so if someone needs to fill out an unemployment form or potentially a FEMA form or mm -hmm. now maybe Health Connect, so when the stakes are high to access a resource that people need, you might, and we may, we discuss this in our iConnect workshops, see a, a quicker rise to frustration because there's more to lose. So that's, that might be a barrier. And mm -hmm. it just, we've discussed just how important it is to kind of stay on top of these systems. We had an experience in an iConnect workshop where we were asking folks to go online and just look at a Walmart application. And the Walmart application actually has 75 personal questions in it. So can you imagine the stakes of that for somebody who might not be fully comfortable using the computer then giving up all of this information? So there are some things about it that you kind of have to, uh, actually, I wonder, what, what is the purpose of this? So that, that's a barrier, I think. Um, yeah, well, the frustration, the overwhelming, it, computers are very overwhelming for people. You know, the internet is never ending. People, they get overwhelmed, they expect to know it overnight and it's not gonna happen. You're not gonna learn anything overnight. Mm -hmm. I've had a lady come in and she was doing wonderful, doing absolutely great. She had never even turned a computer on, never looked at one, never opened one. She had no clue and she was doing absolutely wonderful, but she felt that she should have known it quicker. Very, very hard on themselves. You know, yeah. She was very way hard too hard on herself. on herself. She was doing great, mm -hmm. you know? And she comes back with her husband and they do wonderful. They teach each other at home now. You know, they'll play solitaire together or free cell or the mm -hmm. spider solitaire. You know, I mean, they absolutely love it together now. You know, and they'll be able to Skype with their friends in Florida. You know, and she's got, she got him into Skype which is pretty cool, right? It's just, they get overwhelmed way too quickly and it's hard when, they're, when they get frustrated, it's hard for you to not get frustrated, but you just have to remind, remain cool and calm. Stay at ease, 
if they see you getting frustrated, they're more apt to become overwhelmed. I've had someone who was pretty much close to going somewhat postal over a family dollar application that took an hour and a half, and he was on a phone at the same time being evicted from his home. And it just combined to make a not very calming situation mm -hmm. for him. And it was just a matter of saying, okay, you know, just step back. I offered him a cup of coffee thinking, okay, is this caffeine going to put him over the edge? But <laughs> it was just that little humanizing bit to say, wow, you're really having a rough day. So he's trying to use the technology, make the machine work, mm -hmm. not get evicted, and, and get employment all at the same time. So that is, it's very challenging for people. That sounds like a... Big experience without the computer part thrown in there. Yeah. Just yeah. a bad day rough, all around. Rough yeah. day enough. But yep. oh, people's passwords, they get so upset when they <laughs> cannot remember their password. And they, they can. I have a guy who comes in every week and he changes his password and has no idea why the computer at the library doesn't remember his password. Because you changed it. You know, I'll, I'll say to him, so have you changed your password lately? He goes, yes. Well... Did you put it into the computer? No, I don't remember it. Why? Because I don't remember my password. Did you write well, it down? Did you write your password? Exactly. Did you write your password down? No, why would I do that? The computer should remember it. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. And he thinks that his home computer should remember it. The one at the library should remember it. The one in California should know it. Every computer should know his password. Or they think the librarian should remember it. I've helped people get email accounts, and I don't see them for six or eight months, and they'll come in. And I had one woman, Barry, types her username, and she turns to me, what's my password? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> eight months ago, I helped you set this account up. So, so yeah. write it down. Yeah. Yeah, we actually, the internet interns now have sheets that we can write down everything that we go through in a lesson yeah, with them now, including little sp slots for their usernames, their passwords, security questions, the website that their username and password is for, just to kind of make my job a little easier. You know, it'll help them out, but it really, it's really helping me a whole lot. Does anyone in the audience have a question they'd like to pose to our panel? talk about what we've been doing to address that as the, the grant. Um, <laughs> first, first of all, um, our predecessors in Evermont, so it was a two-year um, grant that came before this, and part of that was, part of that budget was to actually provide computers to um, community centers and libraries in various towns, as well as to schools. Um, so a lot of schools in, in rural Vermont areas, at least, and obviously this doesn't translate to across the country, um, received some, at least technology, through that grant. Now, um, 
we're not giving away any more equipment with our current grant. We're, we're trusting on, on places like libraries to have publicly accessible computers like schools, which in Vermont at least do have accessible computers that people can come in and use. Um, but we're also, for instance, putting in Wi-Fi zones and Wi-Fi hotspots in downtown areas. So for instance, the town of Bethel in Vermont um, had one pizza restaurant and people who didn't, couldn't afford or didn't have access to internet in their houses used to drive to and park in front of the pizza restaurant to get online. And so what we did through the grant is we created a Wi-Fi zone that covers the entire downtown area. So now that the guy who lives above the pizza shop in Bethel doesn't have to worry about people idling outside of his shop you know, in the middle of the night, because they can go park anywhere in town. They can go to the park and sit and get online. And yes, they still do need a device, but how many people do you know who don't have a smartphone at this point? You know, it's, it's almost there. And there are other places, for instance, in Bethel, there's a one-to-one -one program, I think that's what it's called, where every student in the eighth grade was given a laptop to use and that they can take home. So there are a number of different ways in which um, the technology is being um, spread out, distributed. And just one more point, and this one's from personal experience, um, is my grandmother. We gave her an, an old iMac, the, the, re the round ones, you know, the really old school ones, and she had such trouble using that because by the time she got it, it was slow. So she'd click a button and nothing would happen and she couldn't understand why three seconds later something would show up. And we ended up getting rid of that and giving her an iPad um, because it's new, it's fast, and it's simple. Um, so the idea of giving away old technology, from my perspective, is probably not. I know. It might. I don't know. I, no, I, I put it to the right. panelists. I think you're right about that, particularly giving old technology. Uh, you know, an old computer, like an old anything, is frustrating. It's not as fast. Um, it may be better than nothing. But, you know, it's still, often people will come into my office and say, well, I've got this old, this laptop, and I can't make it do what I want it to do. Can you fix it? Well, I'm, no, I'm not a computer technician, you know, I can't fix that. The other thing is, a lot of big companies do give, when they upgrade, mm -hmm. they do give. We've received from MetLife, for example, several times we've received computers to use in our learning centers to, so that we have more stations. But they all have to be, you know, worked on and they all have to be in, in good working condition. So um, I think you wanted to say something about old equipment, yeah? Go say, on. I have an eight-year-old laptop on the Linux case right on it. Right. So it really also kind of depends. You know, I was at one time, it was still on about XP on one day, and it was kind of like, what are you doing? You know, it's like put something else on that that would run it. You know, so that's where the mix and match that I always, yeah. you know, it's like, you're right, you know, I'm not, there is a point where it's non salvageable, but the same sex. I guess it's not really the age of the piece of equipment so much as how badly it's been used, you know, <laughs> how much stuff has been put on it, how much stuff has been downloaded, and can you clean all that off and make it a viable piece of equipment? Yeah. And it's finding things that will, you know, the internet is such a memory hog as far as, you know, in the videos and the graphics and whatnot. A lot of the old ones don't have the memory to run it and that get the blue screen of death and that just frustrates people. So, you know, it is a matter of, I think we're asked to be computer techs more and more, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, at, at a library, people will come in and say, you know, I can't do this and I can't, and we're helping them download virus protections or open office or things like that and connecting them with, with freeware and uh, resources like that is, is helpful, you know, malware bytes and open office if they don't have Word or Publisher or something like that um, seems to help a little bit. But a lot of times we do butt up against the fact that like there's just you know, they're running XP or something earlier and trying to run things that are written for um, something much, a later operating system. Yeah. And, you know, so that, so we do run into frustrations yeah. with that. But we have received at the library, uh, primarily our whole lab was funded by the Gates Foundation um, through several, several rounds of grants. We do receive 
equipment from well-meaning um, businesses that do it, and it's it's a mixed blessing. You know, sometimes like here, we give you this laptop for your bookmobile, and everything's great. But you, if it doesn't work, if it's not functional, then it's a boat anchor. So you know, we have to balance that. The community college of Vermont actually has a program called the Frankenstein, and they take computers, they refurbish them, and they give them away to students who can't afford computers. It's on. Yeah, and all the libraries I work at also will take, if they get new computers, they take the old computers that they have and they will sell them for $10 to anyone in the community who wants one. No, so I wipe them clean and they get rid of them. And the Frankenstein, sometimes, right guys, we have laptops available. Um, there's usually a waiting list for those, but um, it's a great program. It's been very successful. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the Three of us literally even discovered here, we don't present like half the coders in our county. You know, there's like one guy that's a backwood with a weird truck, you know. <laughs> you know, those old like punch card engineers, you know. So anyways, so do you guys have any New York counterparts that you work with? And if you don't, I mean, have you guys ever considered, you know, I guess going into like talks with groups in New York that be interested in trying to replicate these systems? Like I know sometimes Plattsburgh and Vermont do um, you know, kind of IDMLs and, you know, sharing and, you know, things like that, so. Our grant is primarily Vermont-based, so we're, we're just within the state, but I don't know if, you know, within library partnerships or? All of the iConnect material is available online for free. And, and in that material, there, it's wonderful because there's an agenda. You can actually use that um, curriculum to set up workshops, train the trainer, um, the entire manual is there with all of the graphics. So, um, and it's also interestingly available in a Word document, in Word form, so you can edit it. So, I mean, that crosses borders, obviously. Um, I don't know if we would ever conduct an iConnect workshop in New York. There must be a, a New York State Community College system, though, is there not? Mm. They don't do anything no, like that? They're not as cool as us. No, we're awesome. We are. We're so awesome. Oh. <laughs> are we? <laughs> right? yeah. 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 We got it going on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, libraries, do you have any of you work with libraries at all? Um, yes, yeah, you know, our libraries are doing the kind of this, the older stuff. We've got our B library has, I think, four computers now, which is a very big step up from they were about years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, but they're still, they're running the classes where, you know, and what is it that you'd like to do? Yeah. We have, you know, our county has very little computer comprehension. Um, I mean, very, very, it's actually kind of weird. It's almost like it's switched over to where people are now becoming sort of smartphone proficient, but only in really basic right. tasks, but they can't do anything functional on an actual yeah. desktop or laptop. I don't know if you guys experienced the same thing from yeah. you know, but it's, I don't know, it's just a weird kind of shift, you know? Um, but I was wondering if you guys have any programs that you could share with me um, you might check, there must also be an adult basic education network in Vermont, you know, for people. I mean, in, in addition to working with um, people who need to learn computers, I work with people who need to get GEDs and who want, want to get ready to go to college and things like that. And you might just look online and see if there, there must be, I'm sure there is, an ABE system in New York. And they may mm -hmm. be able to help you with something like that. Um, yeah, I guess just to check out the kinds of things that we all do yeah, the resources in New York. Are, and I don't know, Caitlin, if we, if we can provide links, or, but the resources are available, um, at least the resources that we've all created and work with. You might have to do some digging to find some stuff for New York specifically, but I'm sure it's there. Yeah, I think it was there too. It's a big state. So yeah, it's a huge state. <laughs> Are there other questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, I work with a lot of students who are the gamut, run the gamut. What do you think is the one tool that 
anybody on the gamut could benefit from. You know, there's some people who are the smartphone proficient, but totally clueless with a PC, and then there's people, you can see my seven-year-old here playing with a phone. So, I mean, there's so many different areas, but what do you think is like the one tool that anybody could benefit from that, you know, really get out there to people? You mean one tool that does everything? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking now that to my students, the smartphone technology is it with the younger people. They don't have, uh, half of them don't have homes anyway, let alone a desk to put a computer on. Or, and they don't seem to, laptops seem to be considered to be big clunky things these days by young people. Um, you know, that whatever they have or don't have, they can all whip out their smartphone and they'll say, well, I can text you or, or, or uh, you know, I'm not real good texter myself. But that's, in my experience, that's the one thing that people have. And it's, of course, it's very different to use the smartphone than a desktop computer. I've only just got a smartphone about two months ago and I'm still struggling a bit with it. What do you guys think? Um, I think you're right. Uh, coming from a library perspective, I mean, when I started working in libraries, I thought, well, I'm going to get to work with books. I so rarely work with books, mm -hmm. but people need the basic literacy skills, and I don't care what they're doing. I, the first thing I would teach in, in anything for introduction to computers was a basic word processing document, because if they don't have the, the yeah. basic skills yeah. first, you know, to put a cursor into a yeah. window, or to scroll, you know, mm -hmm. to scroll the basic things like that. So I still, you know, of course, as a librarian, I'm going to promote early literacy every chance I get, but they need basic reading skills too, as well, you know, before you get to whatever device you're getting to. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's critically important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, yeah, either a good smartphone, all right, there's a big difference between a smartphone and a good smartphone. I just broke my phone last week and I had the dumbest smartphone on the planet. It drove me nuts for four days before I decided to get a new one. Or a, ta a good tablet. Um, there are some people actually over at the convention who are using Google Voice to enable free phone calls. So even if you, don't, you can't afford a cell phone plan, you can afford free phone calls. So to have the tablet being able to work on a Word document, you know, send text messages, check email, and now make a phone call too, you, that's all you really need, especially for students. Yeah, what resources are available to get people to connect with the program? Um, I say this because I work in, in the veterinarian field and I get people that have access to funding to help their animals but don't have access to process the paperwork like what you do you help them do that mm -hmm. and a lot of the clients are, are living in areas like Hardwick or somewhere out in the backwoods they don't have internet they don't have a computer they don't have a connection and I say to them well that's fine go to your local library connect with your people that can help you you can do that Absolutely, go to the people that are there to help you. But they don't seem to even realize that a library or a school can help them get the information they need. Because it hasn't in the past, they've had bad experiences with it. Um, we see this over and over again, and they're almost afraid to come in to a place like a library because it reminds them of that big brick building, the school, and they may not have made out very well there. And if they have lower literacy skills to begin with, that's going to be challenging. And you know, libraries are for other people. Those are for smart people. Mm. They're, not for, they're not for people like me. So again, we try and really um, be an equalizer for, you know, and, and be approachable and be agreeable when people come in. I mean, we've had people who come in and wanted directions how to build a still. Well, we don't judge. We get them directions how to build a still, and off they go, happy as a clam. But hey, there's a good connection they made with that big brick building, you know? It's like, gee, well, maybe that'll work for me, too. So for people in the community that are service providers that run into other folks that don't have these connections, where, how do we point them? 
with their pamphlets, with their phone numbers. We, we certainly you have know, adult, adult basic a education. A lot of these people have absolutely no idea they could enter a library or enter mm -hmm. any sort of system that, will, that is there to help them. That's a good help. They just have no clue. They've not, they've not seen posters, they've not seen. Mm -hmm. Is there some sort of information we can point them to? And if not, maybe that's something to look forward to in the future. Most. One thing that comes to my mind is the Vermont 211 um, is usually a very good resource for any sort of information that you want. Um, you just dial 211 and, and they'll tell you anything. So that's, that's definitely a list of services beyond just literacy or computer services that, that is very, very helpful. And you don't need the internet to access that. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking is because Vermont is, is very town by town based, you know, some towns may do a great job of outreach with their libraries or their adult education centers and some towns not so much and unfortunately it's really sort of almost a town by town thing as to. Some libraries have one lady that's there two afternoons a week and others have full staff and websites and Facebook pages and you know Vermont has more libraries per capita than any state in the nation. So they're out there and that is our mission, every library's mission, and their job is to connect people with information in whatever format that they need it in. If it's not a book, okay, maybe it's a website, um, maybe it's an online database, but to connect them with that information. So just try and, you know, in, in the Northeast Kingdom, we've worked very hard and, and we're very fortunate that the agencies and the schools primarily work, collaborate on this type of thing and do a lot of information sharing, like resource fairs and things like that, where we um, share information and cope from like Head Start promotes our story hours and um, things like that. But I would just keep working with the, the local libraries and like your, the base, the adult ed agencies in town because they get out a lot of information. I mean, we do for them. It's like, hey, we'll have your brochures at, at the library and we're happy to give them out. Would you mind giving out our information too? So. Actually, that is interesting to me because I go around to doctors' offices and libraries and put our flyers out, but I never would have thought of going to a veterinarian's office and doing it. And that's a good idea because people sit there, you know. Laundromat. Yeah. Their local laundromat. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's the type of people that don't, the people that aren't having the access to the technology and, and need the help are the type of people that are going to be in a laundromat, in yeah. the grocery store. That's where they're going to be looking for it, on a bulletin board. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have the internet, they're not going to look, oh, where can I get help, help for cooking my pie today? They're not going to look right. for it on the internet because they don't have it to begin with. We parked our bookmobile for five days at the Caledonia County Fair. Yep. And all these agencies gave out information on quitting smoking. Hello, have you been to a fair lately? I mean, right. what a great place to give out non-smoking stuff. Um, and gave books out to kids and it was just, it's a nice connection to see that kind of traditional thing in a non-traditional setting. Right. Um, it just lets people think about it. It's like, hey, that might be for me too. Right. It's not just for them, it might be for us too, so. So we're just about out of time, but I wanna have uh, just a couple takeaways on, you know, when we are, when we do go home and we are working with people who have trouble, you know, working through a computer, what are some you know, very basic takeaways, uh, just a couple of points that you want to throw out there for, for us all to take home and say, okay, so next time you know, my aunt tells me that she can't see my pictures, um, I don't get really frustrated. Patience, 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 yes. and be approachable. And yeah. our motto is there are no stupid questions. People say, oh, I have this dumbest question. There aren't any, you know? Yeah. It may not even have been a question a minute ago, but some technology came along that made it. Exactly. So that it needed a question. There, yeah. there are no dumb questions. Just go ahead and ask. Some people aren't going to be as advanced as you. So what you might be like, really? Are you serious? You're asking me that? Because you've been doing it for so long. They have no idea. Yeah. So just judge. take a step back. Be patient with them. If they don't understand it the first, second, third, fourth time, don't get frustrated. Don't get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Stay patient. I know it's very difficult to do when... It, especially working with family members. I mean, I also work at the Community College of Vermont too, and I get asked the same questions over and over again mm -hmm. by the same people, week in and week out, mm -hmm. and it's just, okay, 
you kind of know what, they start walking up to the desk, you know what's coming. <laughs> you get up and you go and you help them. And it's just, you have, you have to be patient with them. Yeah. And one thought I have in doing this work, a tiny success will give confidence for a bigger success. So if it means finding a recipe, then add on to that. Because ultimately, maybe the goal is filling out an application. Mm -hmm. So, and also in our materials, there's a piece on um, pedagogy in working with adults, um, specifically around these issues. So there's some, you know, tips. I think we all sort of innately know it, but it's nice to be reminded um, of those things. Yes. Also, if I could add one little thing, don't just show them how to do it. Make them do it. So if it's downloading a picture and putting that picture into a, a different folder. Make them do it, and make them do it again and again and again until it becomes so repetitive, and they just do it without even thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we've, we've come up with a, a lot of tips. I hope it's been helpful for everyone. Um, definitely, sort of, be patient. Um, understand that there's a lot of fear there. Um, understand that the people who are there are not necessarily um, stupid in any way. They might have PhDs, and that makes it more frustrating for them. Um, and then in many ways it's embarrassing you know it's embarrassing as an adult to have to say I don't know how to do this they'll tell you my four-year-old grandchild can do this so much better than me but any anybody over I don't know what I want to say 20 30 we've all had to learn we've all been that person you know we've all been the person that had to ask more than once in fact, here in the audience is my husband who taught me to use a computer 20 years ago. And I can't tell you how many times I said, I would say, help, help, oh, the screen's gone black, I've lost my document. And he'd go, oh, up, come, get up, and, I'll, and then he would find it for me and eventually I got to be able to do it myself. But I do remember those days of just staring at the thing in rage and thinking the hateful thing. It's always wonderful. You know you've, you've kind of arrived or you had a success. I'll see one of my students is leaning over and helping another one do something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They become the teacher. But, and yeah. that's a very rewarding time. And you know you've kind of turned a corner a little bit. And sure. they're so proud yeah. to, to be able to do that. So it's worth doing. Thank you all for coming. I hope it was helpful.